Good afternoon, entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs to be. Um, I call you entrepreneurs to be because I believe that by the time you finish this session, those of you that are not entrepreneurs will definitely um, consider it strongly. So welcome to this um, um, section of the conference and um, it's titled Christian Partnerships, Do They Work? OK, um, there's a, a proverb that says two heads are better than one. And also in the holy book, the Bible, um, in Deuteronomy 32, 30, um, uh, the scripture talks about one um, putting to flee um, a thousand and two ten thousand. So how can that be? That doesn't add up um, as one plus one equals two. But um, it's talking about a multiplier effect, okay? So, um, yes, we're going to be speaking to our panelists today. But before I go on, I'll introduce myself again. My name is Olive Iluyomade. And uh, with me this afternoon, we have um, some wonderful experts in the um, Christian partnership um, area. Their names are Hogan Bassey, Matthew Ellsbury, and Emil Akio. So I want to welcome you today, uh, panelists. And um, as we go on, I'll ask each of you to introduce yourselves at, um, for two minutes and also talk about how you're coping with the pandemic. So we'll go with you, Matt. Great. Thank you, Olive. Really nice to be with you on this session and welcome everybody around the world. Really great to, to be here. Um, Hogan will tell you a little bit more, and actually Wes uh, just gave us a glowing uh, review of our company, Liveful, so we'll, uh, Hogan can share a little bit more of his story, how that happened. But um, my, my passion, I started out in the stewardship uh, ministry uh, and uh, was very passionate about starting businesses and seeing the kingdom of God brought to light through business. And so uh, I've dedicated my life to a big, hairy, audacious goal of seeing $38 trillion in my lifetime invested in companies that are every bit a demonstration of the kingdom of God, as if you were to give them to a church or a nonprofit. And so I uh, started my life in Indonesia, in the US where I uh, grew up and uh, moved to Indonesia where I lived for five years. And uh, my very first trip leaving the US was to Nigeria. And so that's a, a bit of a cool second home for me as well. But um, yeah, really great to be here with you. We're excited for this time uh, sharing together. You're you're mute. On mute. <laughs> so can we move over to you, Hogan? Two minutes. Thank you very much, Matt. Yeah. Um. Thanks, Matt, and um. Thanks, Wes. Um. And uh, we we really appreciate your support. Um. So my personal background: I was born in the U.S. Um. So here, that's where I am right now. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. I was born in a neighboring state of Alabama, but I'm um, to Nigerian parents. So I grew up, spent most of my childhood in Nigeria. Um, and as many of you know, that's part of life to have malaria in that part of the world. And so I had malaria, um, I don't know how many times, by the time I was 10, but I saw a documentary about how chemicals worked. And right before then I had this ingenious idea that maybe I could get the bugs to stop biting me. Well, I thought it was ingenious by injecting something into my daily life. And um, so I started running some experiments, it kind of worked. Um, I was able to create a mosquito repellent, but I didn't know that, um, well, maybe half a century earlier, that mosquito repellents were already invented. I just didn't have access to them. And no one really thought me to be worthy of being a customer on um, where some of these technologies and things were invented. And that started a journey towards this conviction that I wanted to grow up to own the company that makes the medication that gets to the children. It's what I told my mom a few weeks later. And she held me accountable to that vision. And that's part of how we sort of live for. Um, we are um, we're a global transformation company, really focused on health access, um, and we put um, impact and access ahead of profits um, as a company. How do we do that in a transformative way um, that creates job opportunities through the supply chain um, that really gives people an opportunity to fulfill their potential and live life abundantly? Um, because many people are, um, are suffering are either in a diseased state or um, are dying. Um, and so their ability to fulfill their potential is very limited, and that's, that's what we want to change um, as a company. 
Okay, thank you very much, um, Hogan. So we'll go with um, Emil. Emil, could you um, introduce yourself and tell us um, how you're coping with the pandemic? For two minutes. Thank you. thank you, Oliver. I was actually born in Lagos um, in Nigeria. I attended Federal Government College at Janiki growing up. And then um, when I turned 15, my parents um, thought it was, would be a good idea to um, send me to the States to pursue educational opportunities. Okay. So I um, came to um, Daytona Beach, Florida. And um, six years after leaving Nigeria, I found myself um, playing professional football um, in the National Football League. Um, I ended up having a six-year career in the NFL, played with Atlanta and the Oakland Raiders, retired in 2005. And um, what really um, got me after I retired as I looked to transition professions and see what else, and I was still young and had um, a lot of life ahead of me and wanted to uh, maintain the passion I have for life um, from playing football. But the common denominator in what I saw living in Nigeria and coming here to the States is how our black communities across the world um, are pretty much cash strapped, right? The access to capital, ability to um, um, get capital and um, live your dreams um, pretty much are, are, are very hard to get. They're not the norms in the black community. So we launched our organization called InnoPower, which is the power of innovation. How do we solve problems and create opportunities in a different way in black communities? But with a focus on how do we accelerate economic development in this community where it doesn't take us generations to close the wealth gaps that we see in black communities. So today, um, we are actually based in Indianapolis, Indiana, um, and we work across the board with state governments, city governments, regional governments, economic de development plans. Um, the key word today, post COVID, or as we navigate COVID and post racial tensions is equity. Um, and it's funny how um, awakened most people are about equity today. Um, but we've been talking about equity for the last five years. So people are pretty much embracing our conversation a lot more today. And as you say, navigating COVID, um, you know, I love people. I love being around people. People make me happy. Um, so COVID kind of took me away from people and my my day-to-day -day interactions with people. But Zoom has been a blessing, right? It's amazing that um, the phone calls we used to make, now we just have Zoom calls. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still able to interact with people, um, but COVID has been an eye opener to not just me, but to the rest of the world about how precious um, a lot of the things we take for granted are, um, especially human interaction. So um, it's been an adjustment for me, but it's also been a way to um, self-reflect, sit back, enjoy time with your family, and um, get away from the hustle and bustle that we, we were used to pre-COVID. Okay. Thank you very much, Emil. Thank you. So nice meeting the three of you. Um, so we'll start with our um, questions. So the first question I'll ask, um, I'd like each of you to answer um, in two minutes, maximum three minutes. And that's um, for you to explain the importance of partnerships in businesses. So uh, let's go with um, Emil first. Thank you. Thank you. Um, everything we do for the most part, it's based on partnership. Either um, partnerships as far as connecting people that um, are equally yoked, we like to say, um, because we see the potential in people. Um, we work with a lot with a lot of young entrepreneurs as well. So for us to grow and for us to solve the problem that we are looking to solve, which is how do we accelerate economic development in Black communities? Um, we can't do that by ourselves, right? Um, and we can't always be the ones taking the lead. Sometimes we have to take the back seat and allow other people to take the lead. So partnerships are very important in our work and partnerships are important if you are truly trying to make a difference, um, especially when you're trying to make systemic changes. So everything we do is about how do we identify people that can work with us to help us increase our capacity to do our work? Or how do we identify people that can work with us to increase um, the revenue needed to do the work we need to do. So uh, we believe in partnerships, we love partnerships, um, and we encourage partnerships. Thank you very much, Emil. So um, let's go with you, Matt. Um, can you explain to us about partnerships in businesses? Sure, yeah, for us, it's it's really been in a, a, a spiritual journey of, of diving into Luke 10. That's the passage where Jesus sends out the 72 uh, first missionaries uh, that are listed in the Bible, and they go out uh, to find partnerships in a sense. They 
they look for uh, people of peace. And when they when they find them, they're told to do three things. Uh, you're supposed to eat whatever's put in front of you. We think it's context and community as one. The second thing he says is to eat, uh, is to heal the sick, which help lift up in the healthcare uh, innovation uh, focus company. That is very important for us, but it's a way to demonstrate the restorative nature of the gospel um, by physically bringing restoration. And then the third thing he says is declare that the kingdom of God has come near to you. And so we're our first um, our first partnership kind of idea is not to find uh, a person who is uh, just, you know, a Christian by label, but as someone who's actively working on the restoration in their community. And if we can find that person, if we can enjoy life with them, if we can sit with them and have community with them, we think that they'll, uh, one, be very willing to help us uh, bring help uh, to their community and restoration, uh, but that also uh, that they'll be open to the the third point, which is to declare that the kingdom of God has come near to them, the story of the gospel. Thank you very much, Matt. So, um, Hogan, can you um, explain to us about partnerships? Yeah, um, I, I will. But first, let me say, Emil, I, I also went to Federal Government College in Jenniki. Okay. Uh, yeah, and then I'm a huge Atlanta Falcons fan, being that I, I'm, okay. I'm here. So, yeah, so. Um, Small I, world. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. Um, so, um, love to connect later. Um, so as far as um, part partnerships um, go, um, I, I would like to kind of talk about it internally. Um, a lot of us are talking about partnership from an external perspective, and maybe let me just mention um, the importance of partnerships in um, internally within an organization. I think um, a lot of the people here are going to be starting companies, already start company, already own companies and organizations. Um, and oftentimes, whatever vision that God has, has shared with us, we see in part, we hear in part that that's one. Two, oftentimes they're bigger than one person can carry. Um, and, and I think that the world tries to tell us, tell us this story of kind of oftentimes like the hero founder or the hero whoever. And it's like this kind of cult of personality um, type of um, perpetuation. But that's not oftentimes the way the kingdom works um where we're quite more relational and different and so I, I think you know as far as that goes is this idea of not holding too tightly um towards whatever you think should happen within your organization or how you think you're going to but hold things loosely um, and i think we can do much more in some of our organizations and what we can achieve if we seek to build partnerships internally um, and that's something that we've lived out at, at Liveful. And um, I've tried to kind of, as, as the founder, kind of try to embody myself. And I think that it has led to our organization being able to achieve far more and a bigger, far bigger of a vision than something I could have done myself if I just kind of taken this, hey, you know, everyone follow me. Um, and I've got this vision and everybody come support my vision. And so I think like that, that taking that partnership approach, not just externally with external partners, but internally as, as well, I think can be very powerful. Okay, thank you very much, Hogan, thank you. So now I'd like each of you to also explain to us how faith influences your choice of partners. So I'll go with Matt first. Yeah, uh, thank you, Olive. Um, a really interesting thing happened when we were meeting with a, a group recently um, at Baylor, Texas, their tech transfer office, um, you know, they had worked on a solution for the same kind of health innovation that we were working on. And, and uh, they, they shared a phrase with us that I'm going to share with you that I thought was the most important thing, at least for me, when it comes to faith and partnerships. And I'll say this as a kind of, you know, way to frame it. Um, there's a uh, there's a common perception that if you as an entrepreneur you know, the problem, like the problems, like the bishop mentioned at the start of our, our conference, uh, the problems that we're seeking to solve, that we feel in our soul that we need to solve. Oftentimes, it's not only one problem. Uh, as you work on your solving your first problem, other ones will pop up. And I think the phrase that we've learned uh, and love at, at Liveful uh, that we first heard by this group at Baylor University is that sometimes when we find an impossible uh, what, we don't know what to do, uh, instead of working really hard on the how, uh, the answer sometimes is a who. And so uh, God sometimes has provided a person who has been working on that very problem uh, and is more equipped uh, to solve that problem. 
And so the couple examples practically that I'll share with you on that. One big thing for us as we look at protecting people from malaria and dengue fever and other of these major global health challenges is the World Health Organization and their approval process. It's a very difficult, arduous process. We knew we needed to pursue uh, that certification, but we didn't really know where to start or what time was appropriate. It's a big investment, a lot of time, a lot of money. And uh, along the way, God provided us to meet a group uh, that are founded by two believers, one Chinese, one Indian believer. And their entire process is to work on WHO certifications. And they're taking multiple products through the WHO certification process now. And as soon as we heard them and met them and saw their story and saw how aligned they were as a partner, it was like, ah, oh, it was just this burden that was released from our shoulders because we didn't have to solve that impossible, you know, that impossible what? You know, we didn't have to figure out how uh, we just had to find the who. And God had been for 10 years working with this company on building all of the solutions and all of the practical tools needed to solve that uh, impossible uh, what. Thank you very much, Matt. Thank you. Uh, Emil, so how does faith influence your choice of partners? So I think it's, it's very um, critical that we identify what what is a partner, right? So I can have a business relationship, but doesn't make you a partner of mine, a business partner or a partner, right? So faith does play a big role in in how I make those decisions as far as who's a partner. Um, because I, I need to know what influences your choices. How do you make your decision? What drives you as a person, right? And that determines if we are gonna be partners, meaning we are locked in, um, we see things eye to eye in some cases we may not agree on everything but our decisions are driven by something other than just money so you know i have business relationships acquaintances but very few partners right when you lock arms with an organization or a person um to say we are going to move forward together to solve a particular problem um it's very important that you know what drives that person how that person makes their decisions and in the past, I've, I've had relationships where it wasn't based on that. It was just based on the opportunity to make money together. And when in my dealings in those relationships, those things are hard to sustain, right? Because you are, you're not always going to make money. Things are going to go bad. And when okay. things do go bad, how do we rectify those situations, right? And if we don't have a common denominator in our relationship based on our beliefs, um, I found that sometimes it's just so hard to rectify those problems when the problems do happen. So I work with so many people, I have so many acquaintances, so many business relationships um, and people that I do business with, but very few partners as far as we are locked arm in arm. Um, you have my back, I have your back. Um, when you go through something tough, I'm there to help you and pick you up. Um, those things those things are, are, are hard to find, right? And those kind of relationships are hard to find. So. Um, determining um, someone's background and someone's belief and experiences and understanding that, understanding what drives that person also allows you to understand what drives that organization and how they make decisions. Um, so for me, um, for the word partner, right, um, the faith, what you believe in and how, how you think about Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and how he has impacted your life. Um, plays a big role for me, right, as far as partners are concerned. Business relationships and acquaintances, you know, I'm a Christian, so I believe everybody. We should engage and work with everybody. And part of our role as Christians is to bring, bring people to Christ as well. So we work with as many people as possible. We engage as many people as possible. And we try to see the good in everybody. But when we identify partners, people that we'll lock arm in arm with and, and step for step with, it's important that I know what drives you as a person, how you make your decisions in life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we then move on to our next um, question. And I have uh, this question for Matt and Hogan, and that's to um, share your insights on how your partnerships work. So I'll go with uh, Matt first. Sure. Um... It's really a, really a fresh question, Olive, because we just came off, Hogan and I just arrived last night after spending uh, two and a half days with a partner uh, or a potential partner talking about exactly how we will make that um, partnership work. And uh, 
um, yeah, for us, there's there's that. Like, I think the key thing, is just what uh, Emil said as well, that, that there's that alignment, that that there's uh, you know shared passion, shared purpose. Uh, this particular group is a fascinating story. It's a, a gentleman who went into the Amazon rainforest and asked God to show him what plants uh, would bring healing to the world. And so um, he uh, he has developed this this uh, particular formulation of two uh, plants uh, combined together um, in a special way that are able to treat diabetes, heart disease, and hypertension all at the same time, uh, almost at the same, in, in one case, better than the existing pharmaceutical uh, solutions, and in other cases, almost as well. And so, as you can see, it's a very, just from what they do with just this one product, they have others as well, but uh, what they do, they're very aligned in trying to bring uh, health and uh, healing to the world. But they've been up till now, they've been mostly focused on the U.S. and the European Union with their products, not really knowing how they can have a strategy to bring it to the rest of the world. And for us, our philosophy of partnership exists really across the spectrum. So you have them on one side. We call it our barbell. If you look at a weightlifter with a bunch of weights on one side and a bunch of weights on the other, on one side, there's the technology partnerships, which are people like them that have created or, or discovered uh, God's creation in ways that can be a huge blessing uh, to people all over the world. Uh, and then on the other side is partners with market access folks, people who have a trust either through developing a brand or a health solution or a um, uh, through with the government or with NGOs in the area, and they're trusted. And as we bring these trusted technologies that we vetted to the trusted people who have trust in the market. Uh, it's really, we call it like plugging a, a electrical cord into the wall. It's, it, you know, it causes the whole thing to be charged and things to happen that are that are beneficial. But for us, it's really that, that first starting with alignment and then finding out like, is there, a, is there something we can do that they can't do? Is there something they can do that we can't do? And, and really just putting those, those puzzle pieces together. Hogan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. So, um, Hogan, I'll ask you the same uh, question. Yeah, um, I, I think we, we there's, to kind of take Matt's comments to like a different level of depth is we make a, a strong list. So we have a process for partnerships in those couple of areas. Um, and this is something ML kind of talked about is like really understanding the partner. Um, and so it's like, are we aligned missionally, et cetera? And we, we have this long list, what's the business? So I think that helps you have a consistent way. We actually even score partnerships so we can score it and kind of, because partnership is just all in our whole business. Um, and so we have a very good process that allows us to kind of say, okay, is this person the right kind of partner, um, et cetera? And, get, and gets us to a place of consistency as an organization where it becomes part of our muscle about how do we look at people. We also kind of look at um, partnerships as an opportunity for discipleship. So mm. in, in, and so we tend to say, okay, there's kind of how Matt shared, we look at this spectrum of partnerships. There's someone who is so spiritually aligned with us, <laughs> you know, and like this, like this organization that we went with. But then there's sometimes you meet believers who are not even missionally aligned. So the, the ability to even live out their faith, et cetera, is really challenging. And so that's why we kind of, and um, and and so it's like, and so it's, you, you want to kind of like know your, your, your brother and sister in Christ, but we can't really do business together. And sometimes you meet people in the world who are not believers, um, but they're a person of peace. And so they're amicable to our way of thinking, et cetera, and they want to adopt that. And we see us taking those people on this journey of transformation. How do we build a relationship with them and seek an opportunity to influence them? And I mean, and we see this happening at a significant level. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, Merck, one of the um, one of the oldest pharma companies in the world, we're doing a project with them um, there in in Africa, starting off in, in Ghana, and we're going to move towards the whole sub-Saharan um, sub Africa. And um, it's really exciting. Like we went to this conference. <laughs> And people that we had never met had heard about Lift and Look, we compared to Merck, we're a tiny company, but people were coming up to us and hugging us and kissing us, literally, I'm not exaggerating, and saying, we've heard about you and we're so excited to work with you. And one of the, the, the leaders um, in the company that's kind of our champion in this particular area, she's the head of this product line globally, said, you all are my legacy. 
like this work that we're doing, this is my legacy because I felt like I lost my way over time within Merck, lost my purpose, all these different things. And so we, this is an opportunity to kind of build discipleship. So we look at partnerships across the spectrum. We have a very good way of assessing partnerships. I, I did something that I would recommend, but also looking at it as a way for us to do life with people and influence them. And there's so many examples of that when we become the light and the salt to the world and we have this ability. And the, the closer you are to someone, the more likely you are to influence them. We all know this, if you have a spouse, your spouse is probably your biggest influencer. Um, the, the further away someone is, the less likely you are to influence them. And so as best as we can, um, with, with some good parameters and boundaries, we look, we seek to build as deep um, our relationship as we can once someone is missionally aligned with us so that we can influence them um, for the kingdom. Mm. Thank you very much, Hogan. Thank you. So I'll come to you, um, Emil. Um, your tagline is um, Inner Power Thrives on Partnerships. Um, could you share some tips uh, with um, entrepreneurs on uh, your statement? Yeah, so I'll give you a great example. I'm listening to this conversation and I'm wondering how in the world don't I work with these two guys? <laughs> yeah, right. I'm sitting here and saying to myself, like, how, 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 how come I've never met these two guys and, and this company? Because um, everything they're saying aligns so much with what we're trying to do. Um, so when I say we thrive on partnerships and, and tips to entrepreneurs, is the first thing is um, you have to make yourself available, right? So you have to be present. So if I was never in this meeting, in this session, I would have never yeah. heard about this company, right? So uh, in my football days, our coaches used to say, rule number one is show up, right? So showing up is very important as an entrepreneur, right? You have to be present. You have to meet people. You have to engage people. And the term today that's been used is social capital and building your social capital. But as I meet people, I'm listening to people, right? I'm listening to what are they about? What are they saying about their organization? And if you listen to everything I heard today from, from, from both Hogan and Matthew is, they haven't talked about money. They haven't talked about revenue. They haven't talked about how much their company makes, organization makes. I don't even know how many employees they have. They haven't mentioned that. But everything they've talked about as far as their core values as an organization and what they believe in and their mission and what they want to accomplish um, has me sitting here saying and texting people like, okay, how come, how come we've never met these guys, right? So um, my tip to entrepreneurs and as you, as you start your ventures, as you look to build your social capital is um, too many times I hear young entrepreneurs looking to bow down to the master of money, right? Who has the most money? Um, how can I get access to capital? And um, if, that, if that's the driving factor, which we all know, we all need money to build our ventures. But who do I, who do I build my ventures with? Who do I get money from, right? Who am I associated with that can help me get that capital? So I say that as far as your core values and everything we've talked about in this conversation has been about what we believe as a company, what drives us as an organization. Um, where do we want to go? What our mission is and what we want to solve. And everything we've talked about is bigger than us, right? And when I say us, I mean all three three of us on this panel right now. It's not about us and we've been talking about things that are a lot bigger than ourselves and we need other people with us to get this done. So that's what I say to entrepreneurs. If you have a mission, if you, if you want to solve a problem and most businesses, right, um, create value because they have products that people need. That's why people buy them. And that's how you make money, right? So a lot of times you are finding a need and meeting a need. And as you do that, who you align with, who you associate with, who's going to speak truth to power to you, right? Who's going to tell you the truth about how you move it and how you're doing your work is so important. And if you surround yourself with a bunch of yes people, a bunch of people that are not equally yoked are not, are not based on anything, then you're going to hear everything. <laughs> but if you surround yourself with the right people, right, you're going to hear the right things about how you should be moving and how you should be interacting with people. So that's what I, that's what I have to say to entrepreneurs is what drives you as a person? What are your core values as you build your organization? Um, 
How do you identify the kind of people you want to bring into it? What attributes are you looking for? So again, based on my sports background, right? Um, the best coaches I've played for and played with always knew the kind of players they wanted to bring into their organization, the attributes they were looking for in those players, the backgrounds and experiences they were looking for. And they went out and recruited and developed their team based on those kind of players and coaches. The teams that struggle and don't win championships are the teams that just grab talent, right? I just see a player, he runs fast, he jumps high, I'm just gonna grab him and put him on my, on my team. I have no idea about that person and what makes that person tick. So as you build your teams, as you identify how you want to grow, it's very important that you put the right people on the bus with you. And for the most part, it's the right people on the bus that not, don't necessarily think like you, but have the same drive as you have. They want to solve problems. They want to make a difference. And they understand that it's not about them. So they check the ego at the door. Okay. Thank you very much, Matt. Thank you. So thank you for what you've shared with us um, today. We'll take um, a couple of questions from the entrepreneurs. Uh, and the first question is, um, and I'd like you to answer in one minute, please. Uh, the first question would be, what should a new God entrepreneur do if a partner that has the money does not share the same values? Um, so um, Emil, please go first, but please keep it to one minute. Yes. Thank you. So like I said, right, um, there's a difference between a partner and a business associate, right? So if you if you have an investor that doesn't have the same core values as you, he's not a partner, he's a business associate. He's investing in your business, right? But you are maintaining your core values of who you are and what drives you as an entrepreneur, right? Now, okay. if that person um, strikes a deal with you or signs a contract or wants you to sign a contract that compromises your values, then that's a whole different outtake. Then you have to really... And buck it down as an entrepreneur and stand your ground for who you are, who you want to be, right? But as far as just an investor that's willing to do business with you, it's a business relationship, but not necessarily a partnership. And I think that's what we have to make the different, uh, make the differentiate as far as what's a partner and what's a business relationship. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so let's go to you, Matt. Yeah. Um it's a this is a big challenge and it's it's hard to answer in a minute but i'll give it a shot um so the bible says a couple of things it talks about not being you know unequally yoked which emil answer, answered well earlier um, but it also in isaiah 61 which we use as our blueprint for our company and we think other entrepreneurs as well should follow it's a really powerful passage uh, it actually says you will feed off the wealth of the nations and in their riches you will boast and our aim as a company is to do good is actually to get into the money laundering business that will be so good as a company so attractive from a profitability standpoint from a return standpoint that people who care nothing about the kingdom of god will entrust their money to us that we would feed on the wealth of the nations um to, because of the attractive return uh, not because we share the same mission necessarily. So I think there's two like two quick ways to separate the question is early on, if your first investor is a non-Christian that is not aligned, and even though there's no contractual thing, maybe it's, it's just hard. It's hard to um, take money from someone who's not aligned with you and your purpose and your value and your heart. And you're still discovering that early on, you're still discovering who you are, who God made you to be, and what that looks like in the company. So I think that's a different answer to the question early on. Uh, I think it's really important to find aligned investors. Uh, and then later on, though, I think build the kind of entity, like we should all uh, aspire to build the kind of entity that can take money from anywhere uh, and be bold about what we're going to do with that money. Uh, and then, of course, protect, make sure there's no contractual obligations that will lead us astray. But be, don't be afraid to take the wealth of the nations and, in a sense, launder that money into the kingdom of God. Mm. Okay. Thank you very much, Matt. Okay, so yeah, there's Matt, one more audience that question. Because I actually lived it. And, um, and I want to give an okay. it's very So that happened to us. Um, we were, I don't know, a few hundred dollars left in our bank account. And someone came to offer us almost $2 million to get most of the company. Um, he flew down from New York. Can you imagine that? We hadn't sold anything, done anything yet. 
and he flew from New York, um, offered us almost $2 million and we had a few hundred dollars in the account. And so to ever ask that question, run the opposite way. It's really simple. Like you sh if they may not be a believer, but as Matt mentioned, at the very least, there should be an alignment in purpose, mission, values. And because you're still discovering it is a very sensitive time, you know, you may not have decided yet whether or not your company is going to be explicitly Christian, public facing Christian, not Christian, et cetera. And you should have that conversation with that person saying, here's my faith, here's where I stand, et cetera. I don't really know yet. And just make sure that person is comfortable. So if you can't have open, honest conversations with that person, even though that person is not a believer with you, I think that's, that's if, and you don't have that figured out yet, I think it's like, it's at this stage, at that stage of being early, but as you grow and you mature as an organization, your ability to set boundaries, your ability to determine the terms of a relationship and influence those terms kind of changes. And you can do a lot more of what Emil talked about, which is some of them are transactional and you're laundering the money for Christ, in essence, feeding off mm -hmm. the wealth of the nation and, and doing good um, and, and transforming the world. But in early on is very sensitive. And I, I think um, just speaking from experience and I mean, is a huge benefit that investor that replaced that person to that that ended up coming in gave us far less money um but to date the amount of money that person has invested they invited us into their home they took care of us like our family like uh, an investor came in and took that person's place who was a believer and oh my god the 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 influence that person has had on our matt and i personally and our families i mean they've taken us in they've done a lot for us and so um, so it's, it's been a huge, huge, huge blessing. And we would have missed all of that if we took that first money and they didn't have the faith that God will provide. Hmm. Thank you very much, Hogan. So basically what you've um, answered or what you've said is um, kind of an answer to the next question from the uh, entrepreneurs that I did want to ask you, which is, um, should Christians go into business with um, people from other faiths? And I know you touched on it earlier, where you said as long as the value they have the same values you would do that so in like 30 seconds do you want to add anything else to um to that in order to answer this question i'll just let me just say that we we believe that the truth is not afraid of your religion um and we believe that our job we have people we have atheists and we have people of other faiths that work with us um we're not we're not afraid of that and so i think when we look at you know, partnerships and employees and the whole gamut, um, you know, our, I think the key thing is that per people of peace concept, are they aligned? Do they want to do things similarly? And if so, you know, invite them onto this journey to bring restoration to the world together, whether people are Christians or not, just, just about anyone wants to bring restoration to the world. So if you can start with that and show them how that aligns with your faith, you can create an environment where anyone can be free to be who they are at your work, and you can also be free to be who you are uh, fully with your faith. Thank you. Yeah, okay. I, I, just want, I just wanted to add that the, the ability to live out what Matt talked about starts with self-transformation. Yeah. And so the more you are like Christ, the more, I mean, look, if you look at Christ like, as an example, I mean, he went into this, they, they called him, they thought he was a drunkard. He was partying with the, with the wrong crowd. He was not afraid. He was so transformed and he liked God so much like him that he was not afraid to go into this environment and he could be the light and the salt. And so the ability to not be afraid and to have discernment and clarity and all those different things comes with your own personal, um, your own personal embodiment of who he is. And so I think that that becomes a key focus in order to live out what Matt um, has talked about. And um, just to just to piggyback on that, um, um, we also have to be careful as Christians that we don't isolate ourselves, right? Um, the number one thing we, we need to do as Christians once we become Christians is to bring other people to Christ, right? Um, that's our mission. And the way we carry ourselves, the way we walk, the way we work with other people allows that light to shine. So if we isolate ourselves, it'll be so hard to influence other people. So I think what Hogan said earlier as far as when you are a young entrepreneur and when you're young in Christ, um, the people you associate yourself with and, and what you want to mix with, you have to be very careful because you can be easily be easily influenced. As you mature, right, um, you set the tone for relationships. 
you walk in the room and people should know that there's something about that guy or that person. Um, and you should be confident in what Christ has positioned you to do, knowing that the number one goal is to bring people to Christ. And that happens because you are confident in approaching and interacting with people because the light is shining so bright from you. So I do want to encourage entrepreneurs that a part of being an entrepreneur, you have to tell your story. You have to get people to buy into what you're doing and what you're selling. And you're the chief storyteller. You, you are the chief cheerleader for your business. So to do that, you have to interact with people. But people also see something in you as an entrepreneur, right? And if you don't do that, if you only interact with Christians, then it's going to be hard to, in, to, to, to influence other people to buy into what you're doing and maybe help change their lives. So I encourage people to go meet people and go talk to yeah. people and engage people and tell their stories. Thank you. So I want to say thank you very much to you, Hogan, Matt, Matt and Emil. So it's been a power packed session. I'm definitely leaving this session knowing more about, um, you know, forming Christian uh, partnerships, definitely. So yes, you've um, shared on um, backgrounds, um, how um, you uh, want to know people's backgrounds, what they believe in before you go into partnership with them. Um, Hogan has talked about alignment, you know, basically values, yeah, having the same values. Um, uh, Matt has spoken about um, the who, you know, so not the money, not the what, but the who, who can help you get to the next stage. So thank you very much, panelists. Um, uh, please uh, move on to the main stage. Um, so while we get prepared for the next session. So thank you very much, entrepreneurs. Um, this is Olive Ileomade again, um, joining you from Canada.